inviting me. I'm always happy to share uh, the kind of work that we're doing at A&M. And also, this project's a particular um, favorite of mine to talk about because we're working both with um, local community members and the project is really um, student driven. It's coming out of our student classrooms. I've had four um, semesters working with undergrads who are taking my African American literature course and they've done a lot of the research work, they've done a lot of investigation and I really like this because while we have some local students, a lot of our students come from all over Texas from all over the world, and this gives them a chance to learn about the local community they're living in for four years. So it's really important um, to us. Um, I, the other thing I want to do is acknowledge um, my uh, sort of collaborator um, in this project. Um, Dr. Shanisha Taylor is an associate professor of communications at Prairie View. She's worked peripherally on the Millikan project with me. We've written a bunch of stuff together. We have a larger project we're working on. She's working on a Prairie View Women's Oral History Project. But I always want to mention Tanisha because when you have a good collaborator, you really, you really can't not celebrate that person. So thank you to her. Um, the other thing I want to do is talk a little bit about um, how I understand this project. And it might, it might help you unpack what we're trying to do here. Um, obviously, I'm a literature person, not a history person. And I, and I mention that because um, what I do is I study stories, right? I study narratives. I'm not so interested in this project getting at, um, trying to get at one definitive truth, in part because um, when you look at the record of this event, we don't have as much information as we need to, to make definitive statements. But what I'm interested in is looking at how different communities and different individuals participated in this event, um, the stories that were told, the narratives that were told, because they tell us something very important about where we're at now. So what I'll show you is how different perspectives um, represent this, this narrative of this event. Um, the other thing is too, um, and I think you'll notice this as we start to look through the materials together, um, all these documents are biased in some way. And by that I mean the local black community doesn't own a paper, so they can't tell their side of their story through a, a paper. The white community owns a paper. That makes a difference in who's telling the story, right? Um, we also know that newspapers at this time are incredibly biased. You know, I always tell my students, you think the newspapers are biased today. Ha, no way <laughs> compared to then. So all papers were politically affiliated, had different perspectives. Um, and so you will see that there's different biases that these, these papers bring to this subject. So, so I, I'm not really looking for the definitive proof or the truth, but I want to show you the various perspectives on this event, and, and, um, and that's been really important for us. There is a website for this project where all materials are being put online because we want the public to be able to go and look at them and read through the materials and come to their own judgments. Um, we have about 40 items available now, and I have another 150 items I need to work with this summer. They're there, they just need rechecking because I always like to check my students' work before I bring them public. Um, so, um, this project is part of a larger project with Tanisha Taylor called White Violence, Black Resistance. Um, and what we really are doing in this project is not just looking at local histories, but we're also helping our students learn about research, digitization, um, recovery, all these kinds of things, why we look at Texas politics, race, and violence. And we want students to be invested in this material. Um, the piece I'm going to be talking about today is what I call the Millican Riot, um, which was an 1868 race riot here in Texas. And what we think, and we're not quite sure, but we believe this is probably the largest so-called race riot in Texas. We think it's bigger than the Slocum um, event, um, but we're not quite sure yet. We're still unpacking, unpacking things. This occurred in Millican, Texas, right, just down the road. If you head to Houston, you pass the signs. Um, and um, Again, I want to emphasize that all the work has been done in conjunction with my undergraduates at TAMU. Um, we were talking about this earlier. How did I find this event? Um, it was funny because my husband and I were driving through Navasota. We were coming back from, I don't know, something. I think we had taken my daughter roller skating at the roller skating rink down toward Washington on the Brazos. We were coming back and he said, what do you know about Navasota? I said, I don't know anything. So I started to read the Wikipedia page and I found this entry, which I think is really fascinating. It's actually not there. Someone deleted it. But it mentions, and we could talk about that too, it mentions this so-called skirmish 
between freedmen and Confederate veterans, which quite frankly, yes, everybody was a Confederate f veteran in Millican at this time. The Confederates stationed 5,000 soldiers there during the war. Um, and there was this sort of, you know, supposedly a, a militia that was rallied in Bryan, that seems true, gathered arms, put on the train to put down the freedmen who were marching on Bryan. I've seen no indication folks were marching on Bryan. They were just trying to protect their community as far as I can tell. Um, and there was some sort of blow up, okay? So this is what I found. I thought, well, I need to know more about that. This would be a good project. Students can figure this out. So that's where I started. So I'm gonna try to walk you through what I think happened. And again, the details are very unclear. The historians certainly don't agree with that, and I'll agree with each other about this. But, um, so what we think happened. Um, we believe that an early group that later turned into the Klan, the Ku Klux Klan, marched through Milliken. Um, and of course, Milliken was at this point a small central town, Texas town, on the Houston and Central Railroad. Um, and this, this Klan group targeted a church service that was going on, led by a really important guy in, this, guy in this story called Pastor George Edwin Brooks. Brooks was a Methodist minister who was sent here from Louisiana Synod to work within the Millican community among the freedmen. Um, we also believe that he was a former Union soldier, he was a free press agent, and he was a Union League organizer. We actually have records of all the folks that he worked to re register to vote. And again, think about this time period, working to register blacks to vote. He put to lots and lots of folks on the voter registration rolls. Um, the other thing he did that's really interesting is he married huge numbers of folks after, um, after the, the slavery was dissolved. Because remember, during slavery, you could be married, but it wasn't legal. So it was a political act to go and get married once you are free because it becomes a legally binding, um, recognized, um, you know, recognized event. Um, he, we also believe he performed the first interracial um, marriage within the Brazos County in 1868, which is interesting as well. Um, so the Klan marched through town, and George Brooks said to his parishioners who were armed, we're gonna get rid of them, they can't do this. So he and his congregation filed on the Klansmen and ran them out of town. Um, here is a letter from Randlett. Randlett was the head of the Freedmen's Bureau confirming this story. Um, they marched through, now he says they marched through Freedmen's Village, so the black community, the segregated black community in Milliken. Um, and you can see they, they, they um, fired on them, drove them out. Um, the Klan apparently dropped all their sheets and ran, um, and, and they thought, we've resolved that. Of course, this was just one of the sparks that led to a much more violent um, confrontation. This guy is important in the story as well. His name is Nathan H. Randlett. He is the local agent of the Freedmen's Bureau, and he was also a former Union infantry captain. Um, and he decided, um, the local community, the local white community said, you know, we're really not comfortable with all these black folk having guns. We want you to take them away. And he said, N I'm not taking guns away from you or disbanding them until you disband the Klan. Seems like they go hand in hand. And the Klan said, we're not disbanding. He said, well, then the black folks keep their guns. Um, so again, Randlett, was, Randlett had soldiers, but he didn't have a lot. They were stationed in Bryan. They weren't Milliken. There was no real law in Milliken. There was a sheriff who moved throughout the county, but he's an interesting figure. We'll talk about him more in a bit. The other thing I want you to know is a little bit about what's going on with Milliken, because Milliken as a town was sort of struggling at this moment. Um, Milliken was the county seat for a long time until that, until the end of the Civil War, they decided to expand the railroad up to Bryan. When the railroad went up to Bryan, the county seat went to Bryan. And Milliken, lots of folks in Milliken said, forget this, we're going to Bryan, that's where the action is. So they packed up wholesale, they ripped down their, their homes, put them on wagons, took them to Bryan, reconstructed their homes, and Milliken, um, went from something like 3,000 people to less to around 1,000 within a period of like two years. Um, Milliken also had a really awful yellow fever outbreak that killed lots and lots of folks in 1867. Um, the other thing we know about, about uh, Milliken that's pretty interesting is that um, there was sort of a move by a lot of the families um, 
as the Civil War approached to move to Texas for both land but also to protect, to protect their ability to have slaves. So a lot of the folks that ended up in this area um, when they came, as soon as the Civil War was over, the white folks picked up, moved back home to Mississippi or whatever, and left a large community of blacks. The white community was very suspicious about this because they were like, well, you know, who's going to control the folks, right? Um, and so there was a real distrust of the local black population, not just because they were free and black, but because they were seemingly outside the boundaries of, you know, these sort of structures that the community had in place. Um, also notice, I love this, this story as well, all the Millican and Brazos County public officials were removed at the end of the Civil War and replaced by federal military, except the coroner. I guess he had special skills. But everybody else was tossed out of Oliphus. They couldn't vote if they were still connected in any way with the Confederacy. So I want you to see how there's this sort of moment where George Brooks is out there and he's registering all these folks to vote. And the white community is going, OK, we've been thrown out. We have no right to vote. This was sort of a powder keg because the white community did not want to share power, right? They were very fearful of this and there was a violent, you know, response to this, okay? Um, and George Brooks became the target. There was a Freedmen's School um, at Wilson's Farm. We've been working on finding more information about this. If anyone knows anything about the school, I'd love to hear more. Um, there was supposedly a white schoolmaster who was killed during this confrontation. I have never been able to figure out other than a few mentions in the paper who he is or what he was doing. So if you have any information on that, I'd love to hear more. But Brooks becomes, Brooks becomes in many ways the target. The other thing you need to know about this area, I think it's really important to recognize that for, um, that Brazos County had one of the highest incidents of, of um, race-related violence. Um, some historians speculate that compared to a lot of counties, it was the fact that African Americans weren't near um, near 50%. So if you look, Brazoria County, African American population was 76%, okay? Um, we're one of the lower populations, 39%, but yet if you look at, at the violence, we have um, quite a number of violent incidents. And this is just what's recorded, right? This isn't the stuff that doesn't get recorded. We know things didn't get recorded. So it was a very violent place. And it wasn't just violent for African Americans. It was a violent place. The Millican family who found a Millican they were a violent bunch, lots of brother-on-brother -brother fratricide and the like. So it was a, it was a tough town. Um, this area was also known as one of the hotbeds of lynching through the 1900s into the early 1900s. So there's a lot of violence going on, particularly race-directed violence, okay? All right, so you can see some of these tensions leading up to this event. Um, and what really sort of tipped, tipped things over the edge is there were numerous rumors flying around. One rumor was that a man named Miles Brown, who was a freedman, was lynched by a guy named Andrew Holliday. Some reports say William. Now we've done some investigation. Andrew Holliday and William Holliday were brothers. They were white sons of a former plantation owner who owned slaves in Millican, and their brother also had inherited those slaves. So they were fully... Um, they were fully part of the community. The local black community either were enslaved with them, some of the local black community takes on their last names, suggesting they were owned by them, or perhaps our relatives, depending on how these things work. Um, but we do know that Andrew was a former private of C Company of the Texas Cavalry in the Confederate Army. Um, he was very young, too. He was like, they were like 18 or 19, 20 years old. Now, the Holiday family, which is spelled H-O-L-L-I-D-A-Y or H-A-L-I-D-A-Y, depending on where you're looking, um, there were like a lot of Texas families that ended up in this area. They migrated to Texas from the Deep South, so they went from North Carolina to Tennessee to Mississippi and ended up here in the 50s. Um, and they increasingly bought slaves, and slaves were the cornerstone of their wealth. Okay. All right, so I just want to show you a few things here, and I know it's a little hard to see, so I'm going to read pieces of these to you. Um, what I want to emphasize is that, you know, a lot of these events, a lot of these things that occurred and the way we think about it um, is flavored by the materials um, that we, we're looking at. Um, the local authorities called for a posse. When, when this sort of all exploded, the, the black community decided to protect their own. They set up perimeters around Freedman's Town 
and their militia was trying to protect their wives or children. Okay? Um, this seemed to the white community overstepping the boundary. So um, there were lots of telegraphs that were sent to Brian, and eventually what they decided to do is to get a posse from Brian, put them on the train, and send them to Milliken to put down this, this event. Um, we know that from enough information, we know that what they decided to do is get somewhere between 125 and 300 folks from Brian to put on the train. Um, there's enough anecdotal evidence and enough newspaper evidence that it looks like they went in sort of in the middle of the day, and where would you get a posse in Brian? What they did was they went into the bars and the brothels because Brian was a bit racy at the time, <laughs> and they got folks. Now you can imagine these are not your most upstanding citizens if they're in the brothel at 12 noon. So this was, this was a recipe for disaster, right? This was gonna go south really quickly. Like, this was, first of all, you have a posse, not good. Second of all, they're a drunk sort of, you know, ne'er-do-well group. Um, and so what we see in these events is there's somewhere around 125 uh, 25 armed citizens. You can see that they sent them down. And here's where, um, this, this particular news story says it's the greatest riot that we've ever had in Texas. Um, I wanted to just show you um, how this story plays out because I want you to see where the students have to unpack the bias in the, in the newspaper reports. This is a New Orleans paper. It says, terrible riot in Millican, Texas. A mob of Negroes attempt to hang a man. White citizens pre prevent it. 50 or 60 rioters killed. Now what we've heard is, from all the stories we can see, the person hung was supposedly a black man. So, but it's gotten translated in this paper in, you know, as, as this sort of white man, you know, was being hung. The story people thought um, occurred was that once Miles Brown was hung, that the black community went to grab Andrew Holiday to bring him to the jail to be, to be tried. And that became translated as, well, you know, blacks can't administer the same kind of justice, so therefore it's a problem, okay? Um, so we have, all, we have all these stories. Um, I just wanted to show you the last line in this. This is another story from the Daily Austin Republican, which is, you know, it's the Republican paper. It's a little more sympathetic to the black community. Remember, Republicans, Lincoln, Party of Lincoln at this time. Um, it says, this is certainly conclusive proof that the Negroes began the difficulty, okay? So this is what the students are unpacking. Um, we don't really know what the Freedmen's Bureau was doing. Uh, Randlett, this guy, um, he didn't have a lot of army folk. He didn't have a lot of Union soldiers to help him, so it seems like he was fairly ineffective. Several newspapers say he did nothing because he was in his, his room drunk, which, um, you know, is probably more a slur on him um, than it is truth. Um, we do know that he resigned his position within a few months. He had really, he had, he had been injured in battle and he was in really poor health. It is possible he didn't go out. He was, he was apparently bedridden much of the time. Um, we know that the massacre or the riot ended in the deaths of somewhere between five and 150 black citizens. Again, we don't have a definitive number. Um, we know for sure that Brooks was found um, Several weeks later, he had been mutilated and killed and tortured and his body dumped in the river bottom. He was apparently only recognizable because he had a missing finger and the body they found had a missing finger. Um, there's a really, um, the Louisiana Synod wrote a really nice obituary, a really beautiful obituary to Brooks for his service. Um, and so that's one of the things we've been able to con confirm. Also, we have a few names of folks who were killed for sure. We know Harry Thomas, Dan Idol, Moses Hardy, and King Holiday. And again, Holiday is that name. Uh, were killed. We know that Daniel Zephyr and May Ma and Mac Moore were wounded pretty horrifically. Um, but when you talk to folks um, who have relatives. Um, that were related to folks in the riot. Um, there's also stories of mass graves, numerous people killed, and potentially orphan children, which suggests that there were women killed as well. Um, and again, we're still trying to unpack this, so we don't, and we may not really ever know because these kinds of things were hushed up, right? What's important for this, this news story, I think, for us contemporarily is to recognize it wasn't a local event. This event was covered by newspapers worldwide. Paris, Panama, Edinburgh, San Francisco, Austria, Hamburg, New York, and not just one brief mention, 
multiple stories. Um, Austria, the paper from Austria, had a three-column story about this event. So this was international news um, and not just a sort of a sidebar note. And I think that's important to recognize, too, because we don't know anything about this event today. But it was a crucial event. And I would argue that Reconstruction in this area ended with this event. It didn't end several years later. This was it. All right. Um, Here's some scholarly sources. Um, historians don't really know how to, um, haven't really unpacked this uh, fully. There's been a lot of work done on it, but a lot of the work that's been done on this seems inconsistent with what we've found. Um, so a woman named Mary Jo O'Rear, a historian, published an essay in this Still the Arena of the Civil War volume, and she says, that um, in response to the supposed lynching of Miles Brown, the black militia took Brown's boss, plantation owner, Anthony Holliday, hostage. Now, everything we've looked at, there is no Anthony Holliday. As I've said, there's an Andrew Holliday. Um, and we also think that the, the Holliday family and the relationship between the Holliday family and the back, black community is much more complex. Um, we've looked at um, slave records. We know that they own slaves. We know that Holliday served in the Confederate Army while George Brooks was in the Union Army. Obviously, there would be a bit of tension there. Um, and we know that King Holliday was killed, and given his last name, was probably a former slave of the Holliday family. So what we're wondering is how much of this, it's not, it's not an, um, it's a personal, it's a personal event too, and that's what we're trying to figure out. Um, and we have no indication that Holiday, the white Holiday, was taken hostage. That just seems to be something that she's found along the way, and I don't know where that came from. So what we decided to do is we're never going to be able to unpack all the, the truth, I don't think. But what we wanted to do was make an archive that people can come and read the information that we're reading and try to unpack this information themselves to look for family members. Because of course, if you're African American and doing genealogy, it's incredibly hard to find family history pre-Civil War. Some of these names, some of this information might help, right? Um, so that's why we have this. What I want to say too is that, um, you know, I view this project as a primary collection that allows us to view the events through lots of different lenses. Okay. And I just want to show you a few things we've found so far. I'm sure we're going to have other information, but just to give you a sort of sense of what we've found. Um, newspaper coverage is all over the map on this, and I wanted to show you two from sort of opposing sides. This one is an um, article from the Hickman, Kentucky paper, and I want you to think about the um, wording they use. They call this a war. They call it a Negro riot. Okay. Um, they say that the Constitutional Convention intends to disarm all the whites and arm all the Negroes. Okay, so that's one. Here's the New York Times. It was covered over and over again in the New York Times. They were really interested in this story. They also call it a riot. Um, and notice at the bottom one of the things they reproduce is the Houston Ku Klux Vidette, which is a uh, Klan newspaper. So they're picking that up in the, in the New York Times and using that as part of the reporting. So these two are sort of... Um, you know, obviously cluster these two together. Then we have this other kind of representation of, of this event where the Republican paper, um, which would be, again, more sympathetic, um, calls this a massacre, okay? And they say the number killed is variously estimated from 15 to 50. We hope to be able to throw some light on the subject tomorrow. This is a new find. Um, Bill Page, who's at the university, but some of you may know him, he's a, he's a historian and he knows so much about this area. He sent this to me. This is a really interesting article, uh, letter. This letter is from Elisha Peace, who may sound familiar. He's, he was both the fifth and 13th governor of Texas, okay? Um, when the Civil War happened, he did side with the Union and he was a Republican. Again, tells you a little bit about his political leanings. But what he writes to his wife is, he says, there has been a massacre, and you notice he uses the word massacre of freedmen at Milliken in Brazos County. Um, what they're calling a riot in which Negroes alone were killed. Um, he basically goes on to say, you know, the teacher of the colored school was killed by hanging. Um, the Telegraph last night says that several soldiers were shot a few days since at Tyler in Smith County. So he clearly sees this as a massacre. 
So I want to show you how, again, when I talk about giving you different perspectives, giving you the different narratives, you can see these different perspectives, and we want to represent all those so you can see the kinds of stories coming out of this event, okay? A few other things we found. This is one of my favorites. Um, if you can't read it, don't worry. It's in not just German, but in old style German. And I had a lot of, I, I can speak German, but I can't, I can't read that font. So I had some, some help in translating it. This is an Austrian paper that had this long story. And if you think about it, it makes sense that the papers in Germany and Austria were picking this up because of the large influx of German and Austrian immigrants to this part of Texas, right? This newspaper article in part says, go to Texas, that's where you wanna be. But this article starts out, um, and the sort of, this is my butcher translation, it starts out with that Davy Crockett quote, you may all go to hell and I will go to Texas. Um, and then it goes on to say, but Texas is hell if you're black. So that's the quote, and then it goes on to say, here's all this horrible race stuff that's happening in Texas, but gee, we Germans, we're gonna get over there and fix it. That's really the article's point. So I thought that was a really interesting find um, as, we're working, as we're working through this material. Students also are often shocked by the racism in the papers. This is the um, Dallas Herald, um, and this one talks about how um, the Freedmen's Press, it's attacking the Freedmen's Press, which is the Austrian Republican paper. Um, notice at the bottom, they use all this sort of um, really horrible racist um, language. You know, they talk, of, they use sort of dialect. Students were shocked when they saw that. They're like, but it's a newspaper. <laughs> and I was like, yes, it's a newspaper, right? So they're learning that they have to, as Folks who are reading this material, they have to read lots of things and come to their own conclusions. So they'll do projects like, if they found this article, I'd tell them, okay, you have a paper due. I want you to go investigate what the political leanings of the Dallas Herald were at the time, and then read other stories around this and tell me how that might impact the way they report on this news. And so that's a really good thing for them to, to figure out. Um, the other really cool thing we found, and I know I'm running out of time, but I wanna kinda walk through one or two more things here. Um, the other thing I found that I think is really interesting is this man named Stephen Curtis. And I've been doing some genealogical work on him. He's a fascinating guy. He was born in Virginia. He died, actually he died in Kansas. He moved to Kansas to some of the Freedmen's towns in Kansas. He got tired of the Brazos Valley, um, probably because of what happened with Milliken and Brooks. He was actually um, a delegate from 1868 to 1869 to the Constitutional Con Convention from Brazos County, and that's the only image I have of him. This is from the Brazos um, County Historical Commission, thank you. Um, but what's cool about this is, this is what we have from them. My students figured out this woman he's married to, Adeline Curtis, he was married in 1868. Surprisingly, guess who married him? George Brooks. So he knew Brooks. They lived in the same town, and he performed the marriage ceremony. He was at the Constitutional Convention when this riot or massacre went down, and he agitated to have a commission put in place to investigate this. They did attach this event to a commission. Uh, the commission was titled the Special Committee on Lawlessness and Violence, um, and they attached it. Unfortunately, they eventually forced him out, and here's the uh, 1868, you can see, this is sort of around the same time, they tried to force him out, they didn't want him to be really part of this, this is around the end, right after the riot. Um, in, in fact, what they decided was that they wanted to say that the colored men were wrong in this event, and so that was the official finding, and um, soon thereafter, Curtis packed it up and left, and we might um, assume that he, he was done. Okay, the other thing that's really important with this project is I'm trying to reach out to the local community because I know a lot of you all might have stories or have heard stories from family members, from grandparents, maybe you know something about Milliken, um, and that information I'd like to collect and add in with your permission. I was really excited when Charles Swenson, who is an amateur historian, he meets with a group in Brennan called the Brazos History Explorers, and I see Mr. Harrison is here today as well. He's also part of that group, but I really appreciate the, the, the contact from this group. Um, we've been trying to figure out how we can share information, how we can add um, this group's knowledge to this site, and this group is amazing. Um, the Camptown, Texas 10 Counties Historical Explorers, 
have been able to uh, basically do a whole bunch of research on Camp Town Center Cemetery, which is the black cemetery in Brenham. They've restored the cemetery and gotten a historical marker for it. This group can do many, many things, and they're working to bring black history to, to the rest of our knowledge, right? To bring it, bring it into public uh, knowledge and make it more visible. And so I'm really excited about um, working with this group. In fact, we were fortunate enough to have this group visit Texas A&M. We talked about our projects. We looked at some of the local history collections we have at Texas A&M. And um, I'm gonna have another group come in in two weeks from Anderson County who also is working on some of these black history projects. So we're very interested in interfacing with community members who have, who have knowledge. We don't think it's all in these archives. We think people have this knowledge. Just one more thing to mention. We've, um, we were able to find a local community leader, a man named Pastor Greer. And he told me that his great uncle was Miles Brown. Remember Miles Brown? That man was supposedly lynched. We don't know what happened with Miles Brown. At least I didn't know what happened to Miles Brown. Some of the newspaper stories said he got away. Some of them said he was killed. We don't, we didn't know. Uh, Pastor Gra Greer was gracious enough to come talk to my students. And he told us a couple stories. And the students were so fascinated. They were so excited. They were like, wow, how cool. Um, he told us this story, and I love this story. He said that his family were the Greers, G-R-E-A-R. They were the African-American sons of a plantation owner named Greer. He said, our family history is that the sons, he would let them carry guns and ride horses during slavery when most folks couldn't. He said, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know. That was just a story. Students got really interested. They went and did some investigation. We found in the Brazos County Civil Minutes a man named Stephen Greer. Hmm? And he was involved in a conviction of, um, he, he was basically allowing his slaves to carry guns off property and they find him. We think this is this man's relatives. And we thought, oh look, confirmation. This is why we like oral histories. We can often confirm um, what happened. Let me go back here to this one. The other thing he told us was, well the family story with Miles Brown, my, my I think it was his great uncle, he said the, the rumor was he got away, he wasn't lynched. He said the rumor in the family was that, that Brown had performed some work for, for one of the local white families. And uh, he was out playing cards and gambling one night, had a little bit too much to drink, and he thought, darn it, those people owe me a whole bunch of money and I'm gonna go ask for it. So he went to their house, knocked on the door, and the man wasn't home, only the women, didn't get his money, left. But the women later said, this black man showed up and he disrespected me, which set off this retribution. But Mr. Greer said, but he got away. He ran off to, he went across the river to Washington County. And then he came back later and had a family in Bryan. My, my students said, oh, I bet we can find that. So here we have the 1870 census, two years after the riot. We have a man named Miles Brown, who's a farm laborer, about the right age. We looked at his birth date, born in Texas. We think this is him, so we can verify his story. And that was pretty exciting. I said it to Pastor Greer. I was like, look, I think I found him. How cool is this? All right, he also was the one, he also confirmed the story about the orphans, which we've been working on. Um, our, folk, our friends at Prairie View have gotten a little, little bit further on that. Um, finally, I sort of want to end with uh, the importance to me of talking about these incidents. Yes, they were in the past. But it really does, people remember these events. These events shape many, many things. Um, these events are things that are passed down. These stories are things that are passed down generation to generation, and we need to talk about them. Um, and we also need to be aware of them. We don't need to hush them up. One of the things that the community group is doing that I'm really excited about, they're putting in um, materials to get a historical marker in Millican to, to this event, to the massacre. And I think that's a really exciting and important symbol of what has happened because we need to have these conversations and we need to discuss this. There's much, much more we have to do from our end. We will continue to gather materials. We will continue to talk to people, but we encourage you to use this material. A lot of this material is housed at A&M. We can get it through our electronic sites, but you, the public, can't get it because it's behind paywall. So we're trying to open it up to y'all so you can read about these events and it's not just something that we at the university hold on to. So any information you have, I would greatly appreciate it. I am happy to talk to you and answer questions. And thank you all for coming out today. I really do appreciate it.